Well, as you know, we're teaching through Luke chapter 2. We've, we've done it in reverse order so we can look at the different times when Mary had a moment to pause and to, to ponder and think about what is happening. We saw again uh, Jesus at age 12 in the temple. We saw him in his one-month dedication, and Simeon comes in and, and absolutely makes sure that he tells them who Jesus is, that he has been waiting for this prophecy. We pick up the story in Luke chapter 2. The angels have, have come to the shepherds. They met them on the, on the hillside and said, hey, over in the town of Bethlehem, the promised one, the Messiah, the Savior is being born. The angels were there. They're declaring it. They're giving their declaration, their, their gospel truth. And so the shepherds scurry off to go and see what happens. We pick up the story in verse 15. When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, remember that part. When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. They hurried off and found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. After seeing them, they reported the message they were told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. And here's our verse. But Mary was treasuring up all these things in her heart and meditating on them. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had seen and heard, which were just as they had been told. And so here we see Joseph and Mary. This is the classic time, right? We've now come to that moment in, in Luke chapter 2 where Jesus is being born. And it says that Mary was watching everything that was happening. She was experiencing everything that was going on. And she was treasuring this up in her heart. Remember we said this word treasuring. It is Mary keeping close to her heart so that it may not loop, that she wouldn't lose it. She wants to keep this, this truth. She wants to keep this moment close to her so as not to lose it so that she understands the importance of it. And so now, because we've gone in reversed order, we're now back in the cave. We're back here in the stable. And she's treasuring these things in her heart. You have to ask yourself the question, what at this time is Mary treasuring? What at this time is she looking at and going, this is awesome. This is the most beautiful thing I have ever experienced and seen. Because again, we want to go into the reality of what is happening. They have shown up in Bethlehem and there was no place for them to stay. The baby's coming, and so they're given the ability to go into a, a stinky stable, which is most likely in the side of a cave, and there Jesus is going to be born. And again, this is normal, natural birth. Those of you who have had babies, you know the scene, right? This is what's happening in the dirty hay. This is what's happening with the animals in the cave. It's not only mundane, but for Mary, it's probably very miserable of what is going on. So what is she treasuring? The surroundings and the birth are very normal, very mundane. And the misery that comes with regular childbirth in this cave. So what is she treasuring? Now, a lot of us have this imagery in our mind and I want to ask us the question, why is it that we want the manger, we want the stable, we want this scene to be so magical? Why do we want it to be beautiful? Why do we want it to have a sense that it was scripted in Hollywood, scripted in Disney World? Why do we want it to be so incredible? Why is it? That after John Hopkins writes his, his song in 1857, We Three Kings, why is it that especially here in America, we move the three kings from Orient R, bearing treasures, we've traveled so far. Why do we want them to come to the manger scene? Because we want it to have royalty. We want it to be special. We want it to be mystical and magical and so cool. Well, this song that was written by a pastor, which is John Hopkins, I have it in the hymn version behind me. I put up two hymns the last two weeks trying to recreate a little bit of my past, right? This is the hymn version we grew up singing. 
But you should know that the biblical account is very clear. There's no three kings there. There's no magi. They come far down the road. 18 months, two years. We talked about this last week. I won't go into it. I hate to, to take away your, your nativity scene, but they weren't there. There's nobody who reads the Bible who thinks they were there. It's not there. But why? And you should know that John Hopkins, when he writes it, there's nowhere in the song. I, I read it again and I researched it again. There's nowhere in the song that the three kings that he wrote this song, this ballad that he wrote, there's nowhere in the song that suggests that he was at the manger scene. Why is it here in America after 1857, we hear this song, we then force them together to make it, and then now, and you've seen them, right? I mean, all the nativity scenes, all these things, and there they are bringing their gifts in this incredible sight, this incredible scenery, and again, if you have one of those, it doesn't matter. But for the story, for us to understand the treasuring and how we can have it give us the best life, right? The real life we're looking at, you got to move away from that story. Here's another one that's going to blow some of your minds. There's nowhere in the biblical account that there were any angels. All the pictures, we've done it here, the angels were... There's no angels as, as far as recorded. You're like, no, there was angels. Remember, the angels are with the shepherds. And I just read you that part. When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds go to the dingy stable. They find the cave opening, and there is Joseph and Mary. And so at the delivery of the king of kings, at the delivery of the Messiah, Biblically speaking, we got Joseph and Mary and some lowly shepherds. What does that do to our story? What does that do to how the Christmas season can really impact us, especially when we're thinking about what is, what is Mary treasuring? In the real sense, what is she treasuring? You see, we have created a story, but we must understand, listen, we are not the editors of the gospel story. We're not the editors of seeing God in all of human history and all of the stories. We are not the authors. We're not the editors. We just get to tell the story. And by telling the story and seeing what is true, then we allow this to change us from the inside out. You've probably seen it on the news. I've seen it. Over the last couple of years, really famous people have left the Christian faith. People who were worship singers, people who were pastors, they now pushed away and said, you know, I'm not sure about this Christian faith. Why is that happening now in our culture? Many people leaving the Christian faith because we leave the story when we realize we can't edit it to our liking. And so, so many people, preachers, teachers, worship leaders, all these people you see in the news coming out, posting it on Twitter, whatever it is, that they are leaving the Christian faith. My guess would be the Christian faith story they're leaving probably had a lot of editing going on, probably had a lot of things inserted into the gospel story that's probably not biblical and so when all of a sudden, magical and beautiful just becomes mundane and sometimes miserable, people back away. And so we think about this story. This is just one of those stories. There's so many in the Bible that we know more about what Hollywood and painters and musicians and poets have wanted us to believe about the story then if you actually just read through the story, here's Joseph and Mary, and it's very, very mundane. It's something like, man, Kenny, what? I can't believe you're taking the beauty and the magic out. Can't you just leave well enough alone? Listen, if you have a nativity scene with that, it doesn't matter. As long as you know the truth, 
But this isn't taking the, the beauty and the magic out. The beauty, the magic, the mystery is that God came and was born of a very poor couple, born to just common people, Mary and Joseph, very common. He was born to them. The beauty and the magic that should help us to lean into the story is that the glory of God, when birthed out of Mary, was seen by some goat herders. That's it. That's it. You know, history, not only biblical history, but extra history, at Bethlehem in that, at that time, you know who cared? Nobody cared. Bethlehem wasn't rocked by the birth. Jerusalem didn't stand up. It's a no-count story for the average people. Now, we know the shepherds, they're moved by it. They see it. They begin to tell their stories, and it begins to kind of share a little bit. But for the, for the metropolitan area, for the most people, nobody gives a rip. They don't even know who Joseph and Mary are. They have come from out of town. But the beauty and the magic is not in the surroundings. It's not in what you can touch and feel in the sense of what is happening. When the Bible says Mary was treasuring all of these things, we know that she's not treasuring the surroundings. She's re uh, treasuring the reality of what's happening. She knows. Nine months earlier, she accepted a call and was thrust into the greatest story that would ever be told. She became a major player in the drama to save the world. And so at that moment, in the midst of her childbirth misery, with nobody there except for some goat herders and some shepherds, in a place that she definitely would not have wanted to be delivering a baby, in that moment, she's treasuring the call. She knows that she's now been thrust into this story, and she accepted the call. She hearkens back to Gabriel coming, saying, Mary, you've been found, God has found favor with you. And here's what's going to happen. And remember, keep the reality in there. Mary decides, she chooses to be used. So she knows. She was the human deliverer of world peace. But at that moment, how was she experiencing peace? This is what we want to lean into. This is the story we want to, to dive into. We want to peel back all the Hollywood. We want to peel back all the beauty and the magic. And let's See if we can, and that's this whole series, experience what Mary and Joseph were experiencing. Now, she had seen angels, absolutely. She had experienced the miracle. It's the miracle conception. She's talked to Elizabeth. Remember that story? And John the Baptist leaped. I mean, she's got all these miraculous things happen. Don't hear me say that. The actual fact that she's pregnant by the Holy Spirit, that's a miracle. It's huge. It's big. But it's something that she knows. And in a sense, it's not a surroundings of beauty. Joseph, too, had seen a vision. He had talked. Remember, he found out Mary was pregnant. What was Joseph going to do? He's going to divorce her. He's like, I'm getting rid of her. She's not even faithful to me. Then in a vision, an angel's like, no, no, no. This is what's happening. Oh, okay, okay. So here's Joseph and Mary, the two who know, in a surrounding that they would not choose, and yet, and the Bible doesn't say anything about Joseph. It says Mary treasured these things in her heart. Nothing noteworthy about the event. Bethlehem slept. The child was miraculous. The circumstances were mundane and miserable. So how did she find peace? How do you and I find peace? in the mundane of life, in the, in the misery of life, when the surroundings aren't what we would choose. This is the story we want. This is the story. If this story captivates you, if this salvation brings you, then you don't push back and go, well, I'm not sure if I like this Christian, because you're not being promised beauty. You're not being promised magic. You're being promised peace that passes all understanding. Emmanuel, she was told to give the name. 
the Lord's Messiah, the anointed one. Mary understood. She understood her call. She understood what was happening because she knew. She knows the prophecy, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Jesus is our peace. And so here in the mundane, amongst the misery, she knows I'm delivering the Prince of Peace. She would have been very aware of the Old Testament prophecies. We didn't read this part. I didn't read it. We had it on the screen. Luke chapter 2. What do the angels say to the shepherds? They weren't there at the birth. Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people he favors. Peace is coming to those he favors. Listen, God's peace is not experienced by all. This is part of the story that we must understand. This salvation peace, this peace from indwelling is not experienced by by all. God's peace is experienced by those who believe, those who entrust, those who receive, those who follow. These are the ones. God's love for you starts with him. Doesn't start with you. It starts with him. Biblical peace is not the absence of chaos. It is the capacity to know and trust in the power and goodness of God while in the middle of chaos, in the middle of misery, in the middle of surroundings that you're unfamiliar with, surroundings you really don't like. It is in that moment when we understand the true story They're like, oh, the beauty comes from within. I was having this conversation at about 2 p.m. this Friday with my older son. He's in the Navy with his special operations team. They are now in the woods. He's doing his SEER training. And so from about 4 o'clock on Friday till next Friday, he's somewhere in the the mountains of Maine. They're, they're living like his, the helicopter has gone down. People are scattered. And so for the next week, he has no bed. He has no food unless he finds it. He has to get his own water. He has to evade. He has to do all of these things for a week. It's about one degrees on Friday when I called him. And I said, you ready? He's as about as ready as you can be. And I said, well, here's what you need to know. That peace that you know so well, those worship songs you know, those scriptures you know. I said, there's an element of this is probably kind of cool, but there's going to be an element about three days, four days into it, it'll have lost its coolness effect. And it's in that middle of chaos, in the middle of this misery, I was like, the Lord knows you're there. He knows why you're doing it. You lean into that. All by yourself, doing your deal, trying to survive, trying not to be caught, At the end of the week, no matter what, he becomes a POW. And so the last thing I said to him was, listen, let me pray for you. And I was thinking about this message. And I said, listen, no matter what happens, you know the Lord offers peace that comes from within, not your surroundings, not the fact that there's no heat, there's no bed, there's no food. You see, when we understand the real story, We don't edit in the kings and the angels in the Disney world. Now, all of a sudden, when reality hits our life, now we have that peace that Mary says she is is treasuring, treasuring peace in the mundane, the misery of life. Let's model after, let's model after Mary. What did Mary know? You know the famous song, Mary, did you know? (laughs) She absolutely did. If anybody knew, Mary knew. Mary knew. And so she has the ability to treasuring the peace or finding this peace in the mundane of life because she knows I am called by God. She goes back to her first conversation with Gabriel. She knows she's called by God. Listen, your salvation, if you're a Christian, came from God who pursued you. 
He sent his son to be born of the Virgin Mary, to live the perfect life, to die on a cross, to be resurrected so that you and I can receive this calling to become a child of God. Now, isn't everybody a child of God? Again, this is the, not everybody is a child of God in this sense. Everyone's a creation of God, but it's not until we enter into a salvation, receiving God's grace, trusting him as our savior, that we become a child of God and how the Bible refers to that. And when I become a child of God, now I am no, and I am called. Mary knows. Do you know that you're saved? Do you know without any doubt that at a point in your life you received the call of salvation. You came to grips with the fact that there's a God and you ain't it. And you needed salvation and I needed salvation and grace was offered. The call went out. God had pursued. You see the peace that passes all understanding, the peace we're talking about here. Mary knows I am called by God. Do you know that? This is the only place where true peace comes from. Mary also knew, I am convinced by truth. She knows the day the baby started growing. It was true. She talks with Gabriel. The Holy Spirit's gonna come upon you. You're gonna be with child. She accepts the call. She probably believes it in her heart, but it was probably a couple weeks later, A little bit of morning sickness. She's like, wow, I'm pregnant. She's convinced by the truth. If anybody knows, Mary knows. And this convincing of the truth, she hears it from the shepherds. She hears it from Simeon. She hears it from a lot of people. But in that moment, she's treasuring in this cave. She knows. She's convinced by truth. Do you remember the time when you knew you were forever saved? These are just basic questions, right? Do you remember the time you went from, as Paul says, in the kingdom of darkness, something happened, and now you're in the kingdom of light? Do you remember that? You see, again, a lot of people may be walking away from Christianity because they probably haven't really experienced true conversion, true life. Do you remember? Again, just like Mary, there was no doubt. Long before the baby bump, she knows. If you have the indwelling Holy Spirit, the triune God in your life, you're going to have moments of doubt. We talked about that. You're going to have moments where you don't even like God. talked about that. But in those quiet moments, you know you either is or you ain't. And that's how you're convinced by truth. Because you know you've received God's grace. You've confessed your sins. You didn't just check a box at a big conference. You weren't just moved by a worship song. But you know you confessed your need for a Savior You confessed that you were no longer going to live for yourself, but you would live for Christ. If the power of God is in you, you know. You know. Mary knew. Mary knew, and she says, I am convicted by this good news, the gospel, this clarion call, right? 
Jesus has come to earth. The Messiah, the anointed one, she's convicted over nine months. And right now she's pondering what this means for people. That's what I think. Does the Bible say that? No, but there's nothing else really going on great and spectacular at this moment. And she's treasuring as she gives birth to a healthy baby boy. Just her and the shepherds and Joseph. And at this moment, while he's being cleaned off and wrapped in swaddling clothes, at this moment, I think she's treasuring the fact of, this is the anointed one. This is the long-awaited Messiah. Mary knew. This is the one. Does she know all the details? No. Was she prepared for everything? No. But what is she treasuring? She's treasuring the gospel has just been born. The good news, the anointed one, the Messiah, the declaration. You see, you and I find peace When we remember that call, we know the call, we know we're convinced, we know the truth is inside of us, and then we're convicted by the gospel because the gospel matters. People matter to God. When you know you have personally given your life to Christ, and then you know that your number one purpose in life is to sacrifice, to to live for the betterment of others, to know Christ, When you know your life matters for eternity, for other people, that's kind of a cool thing. That's kind of a peace thing. So can you be a Christian and called and also absolutely convinced and not be convicted by the gospel? Yes, we have a whole country full of those. We have people who attend our church who are just like that. Saved, Christian, convinced, not so convicted about the lostness of their neighbor, about the ministries and the missions that churches, not just ours, do so that people can know Christ the way that I know Christ, the way that you say you know Christ. This is the conviction of the gospel. And when you have the conviction of the gospel that you have positioned your life for what really matters most, every aspect of your life, your greatest gifts, your greatest passions, your greatest desires, your greatest time is in the good news of Christ. You're going to have some days that just are. You're going to have some times you're like, really, this is what we said last week, right? I don't know what you're doing, but I know what you've done. You're going to have some moments. Don't hear me say that. But after a while, oh, you kind of get it back in your head. Oh, 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 I wasn't promised anything. <laughs> and I'm now giving my life. And my greatest purpose is the gospel. That, friends, is where you get peace. No matter what's happening. Because you know what's happening in this life is not even comparable to what is the best Life. This series, Experiencing the Best Life. I'm telling you how to have the best life. It has nothing to do with your surroundings. It has nothing to do with the things that you have and where you can travel and what you can do. It has nothing to do with any of that. It's do you know that I'm called? Am I convinced of that truth of salvation? Am I convicted by the gospel? And then here's the part that we typically just rush right to. Mary is comforted by Jesus. Now, again, reality. What was baby Jesus doing? He didn't pet her on the head and like one of those cartoon movies start talking to her. You're great, Mary. It's just a baby. It's the Savior. He's still a baby. He's just pooping and farting and whatever he's doing. So you got to clean him up. So she's not comforted by Jesus in the sense of the baby does something. What is she comforted by? The reality of who Jesus is. And 
and at that moment, not what he can do for her. If we love Jesus and we worship Jesus and we talk about Jesus and the greatest thing is what we think he can do for us here in this life, these are the people who when things go crazy, well, I'm just going to give up on that Christian faith. It wasn't everything I thought it would be. This true. It wasn't everything you thought it'd be because you believed the false gospel. You believed the false narrative. You edited it out. And then when reality hit, you had no truth to bank on. Mary is comforted by the reality of Jesus. As she'll find out again in about a month, from Simeon, born to die. She's comforted by Jesus, not what he's doing right there for her. If given the opportunity, she pushes the pause button and goes to a hotel, gets a warm bath, has somebody take care of Jesus and get them all cleaned up. But in this moment, she's comforted by Jesus. What about us? We need a real relationship, don't we? Remember, before the foundations of the world, God knew you and loved you. He pursues you. In a sense, you meaning humanity, all of us. We are God's creation. And God came to earth. And the beautiful thing about this whole deal is that you and I don't have to get ourselves ready for the Messiah who came who died and was resurrected, we don't have to clean ourselves up. Again, you go back to when we make it so magical and so mystical and so pretty and so Hollywood, we kind of feel like, man, if I'm going to move into this story, I've got to, got to clean myself up. I've got to dress up and look good. I've got these issues over here, some sin issues, some habitual sin issues. I've got to get all these things cleaned up so I can present myself to Jesus. That's not the gospel. That's an edited form. The gospel is God sent his son. And you and I come to him with all of our junk, all of our sin. And he sees the things in our life that need to change. And he gives us the power through his grace and strength to make those changes to become everything he created us to be. Again, false narrative. God doesn't accept everybody just the way you are and then let you stay that way. There's no gospel in that. We're all accepted as dirty, stinky, filthy sinners. And then we come to the one who changes us. If the gospel Christ in you hasn't changed who you are, you probably need to jump back to the I am called, I am convicted, right? We don't clean ourselves up and come to Christ. We come to Christ. He receives us and accepts us and gives us the power to change. And he justifies us just as if I had never sinned. He's given me that grace. You see, treasuring peace in the mundane of life is all of these things, we have them all listed again. On this Christmas season, this time next week, Christmas Eve, can you say with Mary all of these? Can you say with Mary? If you can, then you will have that treasuring peace. You'll have the ability to stand. See, peace comes from God's truth, the gospel of Jesus. See what I did there? Took all the different words, made one sentence. Peace comes from, started off, where do I get peace in the mundane, in the miserable of life? Peace comes from God's truth, the gospel of Jesus. 
but you have to believe it. You have to personalize it. You have to receive it. This is called salvation. This is called true Christianity. And your life is forever changed. And there's difficult times, there's challenging times, there's times of doubt. But you know. Let me ask you a question. As you're sitting here today, the surroundings of your life could be going awesome. I mean, you're hitting on all cylinders. Everything you wanted to have happen in 2023 couldn't have gone any better. Stock market's going through the roof. New this, new that, great this, beautiful that, wonderful, wonderful. It's awesome. Those are just normal surroundings. Those are good surroundings. I like those surroundings. I like to have some of those surroundings. Or you could have just kind of normal. Or some of us are coming in and our surroundings are harsh. They're troubling. They're not just chaotic. We feel like we're living through a crucible. How is your life? Salvation through Christ. That kind of grace sustains you and gives you peace when you're hitting it on all cylinders and when it's just horrible. It's constant. It's real. This is what Mary was treasuring. 